This is a sweet speech. Last week, while traveling the American Midwest, I met with Bold Like a Leopard in Cleveland, Ohio, and we were interviewed about different topics concerning America today. It was good to meet Bold in person, and we had a good conversation. But before we take a look at that conversation, let me just say this. This is my day job. I am very grateful to my financial supporters. Thank you very much for your support, because the support is necessary and appreciated. And if you like what I do, if you think what I do is important, and if you want me to continue doing this, please consider sending me a dollar or two, or ten, or a hundred, or becoming a monthly supporter through Patreon. For information about how to donate, take a look at the box under this video. Also, if you're not a subscriber yet, please subscribe. I need your help to reach 5,000 YouTube subscribers. Tell your friends and family about this channel. Now, let's look at the conversation. Hello everyone, we're here with A Sweet Speaks and Bold Like a Leopard in Cleveland, Ohio. And we're just going to have a discussion on a variety of different topics, which we hope you, hope you find entertaining, fun, and quite enjoyable. How are you guys doing today? Oh great, thank God. Wonderful. So, guys, we're here to talk about a lot of different things. First of all, I want you to tell me, how do you think Trump is doing so far? Uh, I personally think that he's accomplished more in his time in office than people could have expected. Uh, you have to remember that George Bush was in office for about eight years. Uh, a lot of the accomplishments that he, a lot of the accomplishments that he claimed to have gotten through, like No Child Left Behind and the Patriot Act, have over time become revealed to have just eroded people's confidence in government. So. You know, I think Trump is, you know, compared to a lot of the politicians of either party, he's really come closer to the original goals than many of them can claim. Yeah, from an outside perspective, I think he's been doing a lot of good things that we would like to see in Europe. For instance, if we take a look at the at unemployment, this country doesn't seem to have any, at least not when you compare to, well, Sweden or Norway or any place in Western Europe that I've been to, there are now hiring signs everywhere, including in Ohio and Wisconsin and wherever. And one question a lot of thinking people ask is why are some groups like African Americans or Jewish Americans, why are they Democrats? What makes them attracted to the Democrat Party? Well, I think with, with each community there's a little more of a unique story, like between Hispanics and, and, and black Americans and some Asian communities and, and the, you know, the Jewish community, which I think is the one that I can speak to the most, uh, from the most experience. I think that began with President Roosevelt in the 30s. Uh, there was a lot of identification back then when there were many Jews who were, who were working or lower class saying that this is the party that's going to resolve a lot of the poverty issues of the Great Depression. Of course, he also uh, help, he, he helped bring America into World War II because he opposed Japan and Germany. Uh, since then, however, a lot of them have become committed ideologically to the party. They look at the Democrats really as the vanguard for representing people that have been underrepresented. And unfortunately, they can adapt to a country where there have been a lot of advances for people who, you know, racial minorities that didn't used to have rights like Japanese Americans and African Americans. Now, you know, of course, I'm not denying that there's problems for, you know, people who are not able to afford legal defense, for example. But I don't think that you can say that America is as discriminatory and oppressive towards minorities of whatever type it is, racial or religious, as it was back in 1964 during Mississippi burning and during all the race riots and the busing riots of the 70s. I think we have come forward. There's certain things where we haven't changed because people's attitudes haven't changed. But in terms of the legal system, I don't think that the Democrats can propose anything to change that hasn't already been accomplished. They have to start telling people and, and everybody has to start behaving as if we should adapt to the country as the legal system has already adapted to uh, eliminating racial discrimination. So it's really this is something that political parties can't change, and that's what the Democrats keep selling, that they can change something that they've already changed before. Right. Anything to add, Sweet? Well, uh, so, well, the Jewish Americans of today, many of them are pretty affluent, right? 
Yes. Uh, so it would be in their self-interest, to, so to speak, to, to support the Republican Party. So I, th I think that I personally, I'm an independent and I'm, I'm also Jewish. And I think that I, I don't know necessarily if, if you should support a party because you belong to a class or religion. But you make a good point that the Democratic Party, if they were really true to their to their platform, which they're not, they would be trying to, of course, create a more equitable society, try to tax people higher. But when they do that, they end up writing in loopholes for certain industries and, right. and individuals that they that they get donors from. So <laughs> this is a corruption issue. There is a huge amount of, of I mean, there's a lot of people who are just hooked up with the Democratic Party or they culturally can't break the trend where they support this party for uh, I mean, it used to be altruistic reasons. Now it's a little more sel selfish. I remember I saw an interview with Dave Rubin a few months ago uh, with, with Richard Lewis, and he, he basically said, well, I just vote for them because my Jewish parents told me to. And my parents also, they were, I mean, my dad is still a very huge Democrat. My mom who passed away was, was a very big Democrat. And people can't really break through and say, look, I, I should vote for the candidate based on his qualifications and ba based on his vision. You know, I live in a district where there is no Republican candidate. Right. So I don't even have a choice, uh, or or the choice that I'm given is is kind of uh, uh, you know a milk toast rep Republican. So I, I think that people just have to think more independently. So, what uh, major issues do you feel that America is facing right now? So I guess I'll go first. Uh, we see a lot of uh, just a lack of integrity in the legal and law enforcement uh, sectors, as well as this attitude that there is like a two-tiered system of justice. And then, and then on the other hand, uh, and that's that's talking about the government. In the private media, we have this sort of uh, upper class that they believe that they don't have any standards to, to live by. They're basically they're they've inherited their legitimacy because for years and years they were the paper of record in the case of Washington Post and New York Times, or that there, there were broadcast networks that were the only show in town in the case of CBS and, and NBC, also CNN now, <laughs> and they don't believe that they have a standard to live up to at all. But then they look at people who, who created their own network or whatever, may, may, whether it's Cernovich, whether it's a uh, certain person who believes that amphibians are turning their, their orientations in a certain way, that we can't mention because certain people get banned because of mentioning him. They, these people, they hold to a standard that they themselves could never live to. Live to. And it's the same thing you see with law enforcement. The, the same issues that you see with these uh, people who are officials within the Department of Justice, that they think that they're the ones upholding the law. Well, if you're upholding the law, you can't break the law at the same time. So from an outside perspective, I think it's important that, that America is an inspiration to the rest of the world. Uh, Ronald Reagan talked about the United States as being a city on a hill. And looking at the way things are going in other Western countries, be it Canada, be it Sweden, be it the, be it the UK or Germany, there are a lot of things going in the wrong direction. I'm speaking of censorship uh, and actually draconian laws, like how, they, how, they, how, they, how they've been throwing Tom Robinson in jail in the UK several times all of this stuff and they're doing similar things in Germany and in Sweden I could go on forever and the point is but the United States needs to be a counterexample to this uh, and I think you, you America can be a counterexample because well you have the first amendment but you also have the second amendment and the second amendment protects the first one I mean the right to own, own and carry arms if any of my viewers don't already know this and the right to free speech and since we don't really have that in Western Europe the government can come after you for all sort of crazy stuff. I'll, I'll throw in a little bone in the, in more here. You know how in Norway the government thinks it owns your children and they can come after you for any reason and take your children away? Yeah, I spoke a few months ago about this Norwegian-Canadian family. The mother was Canadian and how they were taking their, their child away for, because they were homeschooling their child, which formally is legal in Norway, but they took her away anyway because the local authorities didn't like it. Things like that can only happen in a society where you can't defend yourself and where you have no freedom of speech. I could go on forever, but that's sort of what I'm thinking about. And for our last question, um, there's been a lot of talk about different things on, with social media, but we'll have no, we, most of us have noticed that Louis Farrakhan 
isn't banned from any major social media outlets. Antifa groups, they're not banned from any major me social media outlets. But there's one person in particular who is banned, and yet we're being told that there is no bias against conservative voices. What do you guys think about that? Well, I, I believe that eventually there will be a lot of censorship, not just against conservatives, but against other groups that challenge certain sacred cows that the media does not want to discuss. Now, with the example of Farrakhan, I've done a lot of videos about him. I, I don't want him censored because he gives a lot of great material. By the way, he, I mean, you watch his videos, a lot of them are pretty funny, even if they're very hateful. But the thing is that, yes, you're seeing a double standard, and you're seeing people who I think if you keep them around, they sort of pr present for the establishment the warning signs and they say, look, if you start following alternative media, this is what you get. You get somebody like Farrakhan, you get somebody like uh, David Duke or, or like Brother Nathaniel, who I think has been censored several times. You get somebody um, who, is, who is like a racial agitator and they want that to be there in order to be the boogeyman for the common person. Now, people who have been following alternative media for several years know that there's not a lot of connection between one and the other. But there are groups that are only waking up right now. There's, you know, Kyle Kalinske last week, he came out against the censorship, against the creator we were talking about, and said that, well, I, I don't like the guy, I think he's horrible, but I, you know, the best answer to that is debunking his stuff and making videos countering that, which, you know, I, I disagree with Kyle a lot too. But he's right. There are there's people like Jimmy Dore who I, I watch his videos all the time. There's probably 25% of the time I think he's right on a topic. 75% I think he's wrong. But you have to allow 100% of it so people can make the decision themselves. When it comes to social media, well, of course there's there's a bias. It's it's very obvious to me because, well, as as you said, Louis Farrakhan he's not banned, but someone else who's been in the news recently, is very banned and may, I guess maybe both of them are crazy well that's not the point because uh, the point here is that one sort of crazy will be allowed but not the other kind and my impression right now, that could change later, but right now my impression is that left-wing extremism or leftist crazy will be allowed but right-wing crazy or even sane right-wing voices not so much, especially not people who are obviously at least somewhat insane some of the time. But I mean, even someone like me could be labeled as crazy as soon as I start to talk about the certain religion, for instance. Right, Swede, they're already going after Steven Crowder, who has never been accused of any of the hyperbole that Alex Jones has. Exactly. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and as, I, as I've been saying recently, well, maybe Mr. Jones is nuts. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Well, I think Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is nuts. I think her ideas are very, very dangerous and they caused, her ideas has caused the death and misery of hundreds of millions of people, maybe even billions. I still think she should be allowed to speak, just like I think that other person should be allowed to. Yeah, and if you want to take some, an example like her, yeah, her, her ideas I think are, are ridiculous. But she's a person, she's 28 years old, now that's not an excuse for, for perpetuating nonsense, but by putting her in the public forum, by having her talk to people, well, maybe, maybe her maybe her ideas will become more polished, maybe she'll become a, a smarter person, maybe she'll improve in life, maybe she'll become a much more dignified candidate than she is right now. I mean, she, she stumbles on TV, she gets caught off guard. The only way to really improve is to be challenged. And if she can't appear on TV and be challenged, then it's not going to matter. And I, th I think that's, I mean, I think two years ago I started on YouTube. I was not, I mean, I'm still not great, but there's still, I mean, back then it was a pretty, uh, you know, simple operation. Now it's become somewhat, somewhat better and there's a lot more collaboration. There's no growth if you don't allow people to grow on their own. Right. Absolutely. Okay, guys, let's get your final thoughts. What are your final thoughts? Well, I think it's very important uh well, freedom of speech is one of my key issues. Uh, a few months ago, I googled myself, because I do this sometimes because I want to know what people say about me. And well, when you run a YouTube channel, you kind of want to know if you're commented anywhere. And I found a Swedish blog that listed his favorite YouTubers, and I was on that list. And 
he wrote and he wrote about me. A Swede speaks is a Christian conservative YouTuber who speaks about Islam, migration, and freedom of speech. And I read it and I was like, that's pretty much to the point. That's pretty much what I do. And if I would have to focus on one issue, I would have to go with freedom of speech. Because you can agree or disagree with what I say. I might be wrong sometimes, it's quite possible I could be. But if I'm not allowed to voice my opinion, if Bold is not allowed to voice his opinion, if Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is not allowed to voice her opinion, instead of having a civilized debate, maybe a heated civilized debate, but still a debate, we will end, we, we will end up in, in much worse tensions and well, I can have a debate with Bold and we can disagree on something and I can think about it and I can realize, oh, Bold was right, or maybe he'll realize I was right. My point is, if we don't have this civilized debate, we'll end up in, in war instead. Uh, and the other thing I'd like to say is that I've been in this country for two months now, traveling around, and I've seen a lot of good stuff. I mean, of course, I've seen some bad things too. For instance, they really need to fix their streets in New York City. That's all I'm saying about, about them right now, but Scandinavian countries like Sweden you get taught that America is a place where you have a few rich people and a lot of poor people, people who won't have any health care, people who will have horrible lives, but people who also are armed to the teeth and are shooting each other and stuff like that. But what I've, been actu what I've actually seen here is that, well, I've been to some of the poorer parts of this country and they don't, I mean people, I, I haven't seen any destitution. I mean of course you can see signs of poverty in certain things, I mean it could be a cultural thing, but people, it's, it's not, and I mean if you compare the standard of living here, if you compare what I see in, in a rented apartment here to what I've, to the places I've rented in Sweden and Norway, I'd say that the standard of living is higher here. Uh, so my point is, if you're a European, and you've been told a lot of stuff about America, maybe you should go here and, and take a look for yourself. And maybe we'll discover that it's not what you've been told. Okay, uh, yeah, my final thoughts are a little more geared towards kind of the issues I cover. I mean, obviously, um, I respect a lot of people who comment on Islamic issues. On, uh, of course, I, I also respect Lauren Southern and some of those other creators that are vocal about, you know, racial problems from the other perspective. I focus a little more on economics. There are a couple stories that I really follow. Um, one of them is the blatant uh, disinformation and hoax journalism of people like Rachel Maddow and the Huffington Post's Ryan Grimm, who now works for The Intercept, who slandered a bunch of Bernie Sanders supporters. They're not people who voted like me. They were Bernie Sanders supporters in San Diego. People should really read about it. It's called the Mattis File hashtag M A T T E S file, like a you know like in a filing cabinet. Look it up. It's a very important story. It should be important up until the election, but after the election, they're not going to be held accountable anymore because by then, what happened in 2016 will be erased by the hacking of 2018. Another issue that I talk about a lot is what's happening in Latin America and South America concerning uh, the concentration of executive power in the hands of the presidents, eliminating term limits, uh, m tampering with the courts, uh, and, and instituting in many of these countries socialist policies. Not all of the countries over there are going socialist, so I, I condemn also the right-wing dictatorships there. But that is basically the model for what we don't want to be here in the country. I don't think that President Trump should be an autocrat like in those other countries. I don't think he's trying to be, by the way. But we have to point out that in Nicaragua, there are currently people fleeing across the border to Costa Rica. In, in, in Venezuela, there are people who are fleeing out to Brazil and into Colombia, now spilling over into Ecuador, so that's two countries away. That's a humanitarian crisis we're gonna to have to deal with as well. And that's the type of economic and political manipulation, control at the top, price controls. Um, you know, also uh, squirreling away currencies in Europe and in Switzerland. Those are the types of governments that have been instituted by, uh, by socialism. Not only socialist governments do it, but socialist governments always, almost always do it. And that's really the message that I like to take. We should pay a lot more attention to what's happening in Latin America and South and you know the rest of the Western Hemisphere than what's happening in the Middle East. I mean, the, the, I think what's happening in the Middle East is, is important, but it's not as close as what's happening right across the southern border. Right.
Well, thank you so much, Bold Like a Leopard, for joining us Sweet Speaks today. We really appreciate you guys coming together and sharing your thoughts on these um, very diverse topics. Thanks again, guys. Have a great day. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. So. And, uh, well, I mean, next time you're here, you're free to drop by and uh, we'll spend even some more time talking about what's happening then. That'd be great. We're looking forward to that. So that was a conversation between me and Bold Like a Leopard. I hope we will meet again or that we can do a live stream together or something like that. As I said in the beginning of this video, this is my day job and I would like to thank all my supporters. Thank you all very much. And if you like what I do, if you think what I do is important and deserves some support, feel free to send me a dollar or two or ten or a hundred, that's always greatly appreciated. Also, subscribe, like and comment and keep us here at Sweet Studios in your prayers. And as I said, I would really like to reach 5,000 subscribers. So tell your friends and family to check out my YouTube channel. And check out my live stream on Saturday at 2 p.m. Los Angeles time, 3 p.m. Phoenix time, 4 p.m. Chicago time, 5 p.m. New York time, 10 p.m. London time, 11 p.m. Stockholm time, midnight Tallinn time, and Sunday morning, 1 a.m. Moscow time. I hope to see you all there. So, until next time... Have a nice day and God bless.